Hello, Hi. Yes. Hello. And thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I have a bunch of questions that are sort of just going to bounce around, okay. and then we can find a through line or not, cool. uh, which is fine. Um, so maybe if we can start, you're our first ever artist in residence. Um, I know you've done a whole lot of educational and artistic programming all throughout. Um, and if we could talk a little bit about you, and obviously you have this incredible family history of being involved um, in Jewish culture, but specifically music, your grandfather, your father being Hazans, you know, your sister does music. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what it was like growing up and what influence has had on you up till now? Sure. Um, so I grew up in, a, I guess you could call it a modern Orthodox Jewish household. Um, so we were pretty strictly, um, we followed uh, you know, Jewish law pretty strictly and I, I spent time in, in Jewish day schools and learning about um, all of that. Um, but my parents are also very artistic people. My dad is a musician. And my mom um, was always, I mean, she was an artist, an art teacher, um, and also specifically involved in Jewish education through the arts. So, you know, I mean, it, it was sort of always part of our growing up, my sisters and I, was just Judaism through creativity. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so even as I got into other things, as I got older, music-wise and art-wise, you know, Judaism and, and my connection to, to Jewish religion and culture was always a strong part of whatever I was doing. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, as you mentioned, you know, um, the religion part was, you know, came from, um, my grandfather was a rabbi, um, and this is a story I tell a lot, but he, um, he was a rabbi in Memphis, Tennessee in the early 50s and they shared a house. He and my grandma, my, my grandma, um, my bubby, uh, had a house, um, and it was a two-level house that they shared with Elvis Presley's family. Elvis was about 15 years old, I think, um, and it was just before he made his first record, um, I believe in 54. So they were there from 48 to 54, and um, his mom and my grandmother were really close, and. Um, when he cut his first record, they had to borrow my grandparents' record player to play it because they were too poor to own one. Um, meanwhile, whenever the only records my grandfather ever played were Cantorial's records, so we always joke about how Elvis was hearing, you know, Cantor Rosenblatt, you know, blasting from downstairs, and maybe that's where he learned some of his moves. But anyway, so you know, so and uh, and my dad, um, you know, is a prayer leader and uh, has a Jewish band down here actually um, that I did my first gigs with playing like weddings with him and um, yeah so that's sort of you know the Jewish part of my musical background and, and you know of course Shabbat and holidays were always filled with singing um, that was a big part of it always and, and I think that um, you know the way I approach music still starts from there actually it's mm -hmm. like just the the ability to be able to sing something is so important in how I approach music. You know, mm -hmm. even if it's not, you know, even if I'm writing a melody that's not something that somebody's going to go and sing, because I write a lot of instrumental music that might be a little weird and complex, but there has to, to me, the approach of, of something that sticks in your head and something that can be sung, mm -hmm. you know, in some, some respect, I think actually comes from my experience with, with just Jewish song and prayer and things like that. Um, so this next question is a little bit awkward in the sense of, you know, trying to talk about music rather than play it. Obviously, it's more mm -hmm. natural to play, and it's the whole, you know, trying to write or talk about music is like dancing about architecture. But you mentioned I, a line I really like that you just said is uh, that part of the major way in which you find your Judaism is through creativity. If we can go into that a little bit deeper, you are observant, you're interested in Judaism from a sort of liturgical level, from a religious level as well. Um, is there a separation in your music where at some points you feel like you're most more closely going off of a musical or an artistic tradition, and at other points you're more interested in exploring religious texts or precepts or concepts, um, or those two so interwoven that it's not actually possible to separate them? 
I might need you to repeat that question. Sure. Um, and also, just to, quali just to qualify, I'm no longer observant in the way that I was. Mm -hmm. Like, I still connect. I, I don't want to mislead people on the, mm -hmm. on the video. Just like, sure, yeah. you know, like, um, we're definitely involved in synagogue thing, but I'm not mm -hmm. really like, Shabbat observant in the mm. way that I used to be or okay. things like that. So okay. just, just so you Yeah, know. no, it's a um, good separation. So I guess the question, again, this, this one we might just have to sort of scratch in the record because it's easier to ask than to answer, and I'm not sure there is well, an let me answer. Hear it again, yeah. So essentially my question is you're deeply rooted in the religious side, whether you're currently as observant as you used to be. Sure. Um, I certainly hear what you're saying, but you're not sort of coming to this as someone that's not familiar with Jewish texts, religion, sure. faith. Um, and then there's this other layer which also has a very rich and long tradition of Jewish melody, of Jewish arts, of Jewish culture. Um, and when you're approaching a new project or a song or a band, is it possible or interesting to separate those two and sometimes you're more involved one or the other? Sure. Or is it, you know, they're so intertwined that it's, you know, you're, you're firing on both ends at once? No, that's a great question. I mean, and it's something I've thought a lot about, you know. Um, I think it sort of goes both ways. Like I have projects that I've approached, like the last project I did was a project called Schizophonia, mm -hmm. um, which was a record that I did of, um, I found uh, cantorial recordings that I liked um, from various parts of like the early to mid 20th century and um, arranged them for a kind of this, I guess you could call it a, like a progressive rock band, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I sang on that. That was the first time I'd done that on a recording in a really long time. So, um, and, and uh, so that was really a, a, an instance of like, okay, like this is like Jewish prayer music mm -hmm. that I'm really um, taking out of context and taking it out of its context, I should say, and and re reworking it. So sort of engaging with the text and what the text mean, but also, you know taking it somewhere else. And in, in fact, the name schizophonia, the word schizophonia is a word that um, literally means the removal of sound from its original source. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's like when recorded music began, mm -hmm. um, that, like, when you could hear the sound of a bird chirping, mm -hmm. not in, in the tree, but in your home, that mm -hmm. was the idea of schizophonia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and. So in that case, that, that's where the Judaism and the, the music really like came together. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, I could say the same thing about Beethoven, maybe to a lesser extent, but um, where when I started that band, you know, I was really like engaging with both things at the same time and, and being influenced by other people who were doing that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, you know, and then to take, you know, just going through the, the projects that are at this residency, you know, a band like Sandcatchers, which is a more recent project of mine, I, I really did an approach in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the um, the music that I wrote and I'm writing for that band is much more, um, you know, it's it's based in certain things, but it's it's not it's not a Jewish <laughs> in the way that those other projects are. I think mm -hmm. that, and that would be a good example of, of the thing that you were asking in, in the sense of the Jewish music just kind of influencing the way I write anything, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, for ex an example of that is actually um, one of the tunes we play with Sandcatchers is called Heading South, and um, it's a melody that I wrote while I was trying to put my then infant son to bed. Mm -hmm. I was like holding him in, in his bedroom and trying to rock him to sleep, and I just, you know, I, I initially thought of that melody as like a nigun. I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I was like, oh, this would be like a really nice like nigun, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for who knows what. But then as Sandcatcher started to, you know, get off the ground a little bit, I was sort of writing some material and thinking about it. And I was like, wait, that tune would actually kind of work perfectly. And so that's a sort of a good example of how like mm -hmm. the Jewish music sort of is sort of always there for mm -hmm. me. It's always coming into everything I do, so, yeah. Great, that makes sense. Um, so you covered actually the project, uh, which I was gonna ask you about. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, so you did a residency yesterday, and I know it's, um, or sorry, you did a, a master class yesterday at American University, and I know it's something that you've done a bit of in the past as well, education. Can you talk about for those that weren't in the master class like myself, what's that process like? What are you hoping to, 
uh, transfer from the stage to the audience uh, that's different, obviously, than a show. Yeah, I mean, what was really great, um, first of all, thank you so much to, to American University for hosting us and Nancy Snyder there, who is amazing and mm -hmm. runs a really great program. And just the fact that they were willing to have us there, I think, says a lot about, um, you know, what they're doing there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went with Mike Friedman, who's the lap steel player in Sandcatchers. Um, and basically what we did is we kind of um, did sort of a breakdown of our different approaches to writing and, and being musicians. And some of the stuff I was just talking about. And, mm -hmm. um, and we played some examples because I feel like at those kinds of things, just actually playing music, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, people only want to be talked at so much and at mm -hmm. some point you have to show them what you are sure. about. You well, know? and they also probably appreciate it on a different level being that it's a crowd full of musicians. Exactly, so. exactly. And um, yeah, and then uh, we talked a lot about um, sort of the nitty gritty of just being a musician, especially like up in New York where a lot mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff is happening and, and Mike talked a lot about how to practice when you know, when life is happening. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about being both, both of us are dads and talking about how to right. maximize your practice time. And, and, you know, I talked some about, you know, how to exist um, just as a professional musician and just be mm -hmm. a good professional, whatever mm -hmm. that means for you. You right. know, like be somebody that, you know, is, holds to your core principles, but is also like easy enough to work with. and. Mm -hmm. You know, just things like that. Um, mm -hmm. to try to throw a lot into a little, mm -hmm. little space. But as Mike said, um, you know, he he went to a, he had a lot of master classes when he was in school, and you know, he said a lot of times, um, whoever was giving it, you know, there would be so much information put out, and like often it was just like one little stone or one little shred that you like mm -hmm. stuck with you. So that's the hope is that mm -hmm. there's one or two or three little things that we mm -hmm. said or played or did that. We'll stick with people, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so one thing, and I don't know if it came up in the master class, but obviously there's this hub of Jewish culture in general. Certainly, music in New York, where you are in Brooklyn. Um, how can we hope to export that better to the rest of the country? Is that even a useful thing? Because so much of you know Judaism is obviously centered around New York, um, but here in D.C. and you know hopefully other places in the country. Where you know we certainly have a Jewish life and a culture, but I don't think we have as much of a richness and a depth and an availability. Honestly, of right. just you know you can go any night in New York and check out three or four different right. um, Jewish cultural activities, if not scores more than that. Right. So you, you're saying how, how can we explain? Well, yeah. I mean, do, do you see anything? I mean, other than of course you tour and you travel. Like, do you see either hope or interesting trends other places of sort of Jewish life, not necessarily based around New York, that's sprouting up? Well, I think the work that you guys are doing is amazing. I mean, I you know, in in engaging with, um, or I should say, I think the work that the Washington Jewish Music Festival is doing is amazing, and um, in other places that I've played, um, with with similar you know kinds of um, events and organizations, I, I think is super important, As, and especially that those organizations and events be forward thinking and and trying to trying to expand what what it means to have Jewish culture and, and music at, at the events. Um, so we were at Ash, the Ashkenaz Festival in Toronto this summer, and that's mm -hmm. another place that's doing a lot of really great work. Mm -hmm. um, in Krakow, the Krakow Jewish Culture Festival, um, I've been a few times, and that, that festival is, is really a great model for, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I encourage anybody who, who, um, who does this kind of work to go check that out, because it's really like, it's run by people who really just are fans of the art and the music mm -hmm. and just really like want it to be a good time, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, Krakow is, has interesting things. I think, um, um, let's see, where else was I? Um, I might have to get back to you. Okay, but fine. California, the Northern California has a great, great scene there. I feel like Detroit has mm -hmm. some things going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, and, and, and yeah, as you said, you know, I, I know so many people in New York who are doing great and interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, oh, another thing is the, uh, uh, some friends of mine started 
running a thing called Giddish New York, mm -hmm. which is happening in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really great, uh, you know, it's interesting you said New York was sort of a hub of all this stuff, but mm -hmm. You know, the, but all the musicians and artists are going outside of New York to perform because there's so much happening there. So New mm -hmm. York actually ends up with less of an organized um, presentation right. of... It's almost like an incubator of sorts. Exactly. Kind of so this thing in New York is sort of our version of like a, a New York-based Jewish festival, which mm -hmm. I think is actually really great, you know, to have. Absolutely. Yeah. So... So you talked about sort of forward thinking, moving Jewish culture forward as certainly something we're trying to do at the Washington Jewish Music Festival. I know a lot of other places you mentioned are always looking to, you know, simultaneously look at the rich history and tradition of Jewish culture and music, but also see how it fits into modern society, um, look at innovative art forms, etc. And you're obviously really involved in that through, with um, the radical Jewish culture and John Zorn. And, can you talk a little bit about, obviously, Potom is on that label, but you're so much in that milieu. What are some of people maybe aren't familiar with it as much? What are some of the basic precepts? What are the things that bring you together? What does that even mean, radical Jewish culture? Sure. Um, so, um, John Zorn started radical Jewish culture, started Sadiq and radical Jewish culture in the early 90s. And um, I think he was uh, very interested in the idea of, of Jewish music as something beyond what, what we had initially thought of it as being. So, um, so taking things like klezmer um, and other kinds of like Jewish cultural musics and just taking that, seeing where else they went, you know? Um, you know, so like one of the early records he put out was David Krakauer, who is, you know, um, you know, the foremost klezmer clarinetist, you know? Um, and so it wasn't about necessarily taking it, taking Jewish music out of what it was, but seeing like where it could go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, at the same time, Krakauer puts out an album, but you know, then he's doing uh, his Masada Quartet, which mm -hmm. is something completely different. And it's mm -hmm. like much more like Ornette Coleman, you know, um, mm -hmm. with uh, some Jewish things happening there. So, um, you know, the idea is really to, um, to leave the concept of of Jewish music up to the artist mm -hmm. and up to the person making the art, instead of having a um, having a larger definition of what that means. Mm -hmm. That 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 is sort of the mm -hmm. standard that everybody has to follow. And he actually has a great essay about it on on his website sadik.com, of the website of the label, where he he breaks it down actually. Um, but I think that's the idea. Is is really like you know, putting it in the hands of the artists um, to interpret what that means, and uh, and 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 that opens up a lot of really interesting doors, I think, for mm -hmm. for what Jewish music can be. Mm -hmm. And I think the the, t the title of the, the part of the label is really you know apt, radical Jewish culture. It's exactly what it is, you mm -hmm. know, um, and it's really you know, it's amazing to know so many people doing so many different great things. You had John Madoff and mm -hmm. Diane 80 last year. It's a band I play in that um, mm -hmm. is recording Zorn's like Book of Angels music, uh, which is a whole book of tunes, multiple books of tunes that he's writing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, I, it's, it's a really amazing community to be a part of, yeah. Um, I think maybe just one or two more, just to sort of cover all the projects that you're here with. Um, it's not one that you founded, but one you're very involved with, Sundara. Can you talk a little bit about where that sound came from? Because I think when people are reading our description, uh, which, you know, we mainly took from uh, the description that was uh, already extant, you have this group that's taking, you know, music that's in Urdu and music that's in languages we're not as familiar with traditionally doing Jewish song um, and Afghani and Pakistani. Um, traditions, and the, it seems to me that they're sort of purposely smashed together with Jewish music. It's not that there's, sometimes there's a natural through line, but oftentimes they're originally artificially put together in a way that creates organically something beautiful and new, which is, it's not on Tadzik as far as I understand, but it's of that same mindset of, you know, there's a whole possibility of what Jewish music could be 
that's not exactly where it came from. So can you talk a little bit about that project and, and where that's headed? Sure, I'll do my best to talk about it without, as you said, without being one of the, the ones who, um, who incubate or who started it. Um, it was started by my friend uh, Michael Winograd, amazing, another one of the foremost klezmer clarinetists mm -hmm. um, and just a great, great musician and great, great person. And he, um, if I'm getting the story right, he met Zabe Bangash, who is um, a uh, fairly well-known singer in Lahore, Pakistan, um, at some kind of performance. And it turns out uh, through they had some some connections through um, some of the world music uh, people, and it turns out she had Michael's album mm -hmm. that this uh, one of one of her friends had given to her, and was a big fan of not just that album but klezmer music. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing led to another, and then they got the idea to start this project. Um, and you know, it had sort of different. There were different ideas of it at the beginning, but eventually um, we started to uh, to work really with the music of uh, the region called Balochistan, which is a really sort of un... It's a, it's a very rural part of um, southern Pakistan, Afghanistan border, I think it like crosses over. Um, and there's some really interesting music that hasn't really just, has just sort of been there. Um, and we started arranging that music for this band, you know, which was a really interesting makeup of, you know, myself, you know, with whatever history I have, the, um, an amazing Turkish violinist, um, Elin Bashalda, and uh, drummer Richie Barche, who's a, in, you know, amazing like jazz and world music drummer in the Cosmetics. Um, Patrick Farrell is a s accordion player, and. Um, uh, and there's been various bass players, there's been a few now. But um, now David Lisby, who's a, you know, a rock and world music bass player. Um, but, uh, you know, so it was like this kind of thing where um, it started out as this, like, it, it, it's coming from, like, these sort of Eastern European musical roots meeting the Pakistani music because of the two people who started the band. Mm -hmm. But... You know, from there, it's sort of, it's off to the races, I think, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, we, like in our set, there's a, we do a klezmer tune, actually, mm -hmm. that she, or it's a, it's like a klezmer tune that she sings some words to. It's mm -hmm. like a very cool yeah. um, thing. And then we also do... Um, words that she, they're brand new, or are they taken from poetry or something from that? Area. I can't remember actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, sh I wish I could tell you. Right. Um, but uh, you know, and then there's you know other songs where they're you know the song will start with a clarinet doina, you know, mm -hmm. a, a clarinet like mm -hmm. uh, improvisation that you would hear mm -hmm. maybe like uh, you know Dave Terrace do on an old mm -hmm. Cosmo recording. But um, you know, then it goes right into a you know a, a song in Urdu, you know that. Um, is not Klezmer, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I mean, I think that's, that's sort of where the band is coming from, you know, I think without trying too hard to really define anything, like that's sort of, um, that's sort of where the directions that that band takes, I think, you know. I think we've covered most of it. I mean, I don't know if you have any new projects that you're interested in sharing or um, exciting things to come for yourself. Yeah. Um, um, it'd be nice to hear if you do. Sure. If not, that's fine. Um, well, Sandcatchers has been my primary uh, sort of focus these days, and we just got out of the studio. Uh, we recorded with actually the cellist Eric Friedlander, who's mm -hmm. another person in the Tzadik Records world, who's just one of all of our musical heroes, and um, it was just such a pleasure to record with him. So, um, and I can tell you just from listening to the rough mixes, it's going to be a really uh, magical album. I'm very, awesome. very excited to get it out. So um, that that's going to be the next thing. Um, Pitom, we're going to go back into the studio probably in the winter. Um, and uh, we're playing a whole set of new music at this show. And, and uh, it's been, been coming along really nicely. So, um, you know, and Zion 80 has an album that we're working on this winter too. Um, lots of stuff, lots of good stuff.
Yeah. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for making it for all of us. Thank you so much for having me.